Hello friends, I'm coming to you with a Plik 4 plus 17 that we timed. And this is on my Brewmaster. It is push week after all, so I've been spending quite a bit of time on my Brewmaster, just doing keys. The first pull here, it's you know, you guys are no stranger to it. I think it's pretty much standard now. You pull the first fungal pack with the giant. And what you do is you just get someone sitting on the fungi stormer. You just interrupt the fungi storm. That does a lot of damage and fortified. And you can basically just uh, get two kicks on the fungal mancer and the rotting flash giant, and you'll be completely okay. I think we didn't kick one of the giants' cast, that's why we're getting crawlers here. So this is a plus seventeen key that we knew that you know we had to take certain amount of risk to try and squeeze a bit more DPS from things and whatnot. Um, and you can see that in this route, I did something different from my MDT route. It's, it's a very slight distinction um, from the MDT route video that I did for all eight dungeons. And that's really because like, as the key levels get higher and higher, I kind of need to start thinking about the trade-off between risk and reward. As per all decisions in life, if, if you are not aware, <laughs> we're all playing an MMO called Real Life. So the risk reward trade off in World of Warcraft is basically the same thing. It's if I pull this pack, it is more risky. We might potentially die, but if it chips off time from our timer, that is absolutely absolutely needed to time higher and higher keys. Then, you know, from a risk reward perspective, it kind of makes sense. You know, this is a very geeky thing to say, but you know, that's that's me basically. <laughs> I love to think about such things. So. Working on the Fungal Benzer here, and for me, I'm just assigning kicks. Um, we have a mage that can spell steal the Wonder Girl that gives him a lot more DPS. Obviously, he's in, he's in his combustion window, as you guys can see from his DPS on the pack. I have Potter on this pack because um, I was dipping a bit low. Again, letting him uh, just spell steal the buff and whatnot. Uh, Fungi Storm, which I stunned over here to get a DB from my mage. That could have been better coordinated. All right, and then the next pull is what I what I think it's a very good example of risk reward. We basically end up pulling the entire room because I felt like on a plus seventeen you need to make big plays or seventeen and higher you need to start making bigger and bigger plays. You can obviously do it safe by just pulling half the room, um, but you know the the chances of. You, know, you running out of time in a higher and higher keys is is a pretty realistic um, you know worry so i pulled everything here and you guys can see i pop fortifying brew also heavy stagger i had to hear and pot as well and kind a little here the rationale why i pop weapons of order here is because uh, as you guys might already know weapons of order give a increased mastery um you know on use and that basically is you just try and help me mitigate damage through dodges um, of all the mobs. And with so many mobs on you, you're bound to dodge some physical attacks. Um, so that's a bit of my thinking why I put weapons of order there. Alright, so we're working on this pick voucher and our group has very very good control around the ads, that's for sure. With slows and stuns and kites and whatnot. There's something I have been meaning to do on my Brewmaster that I really need to get to and that is I need to start binding Clash um, as an ability because when I used it on beta it was super buggy like it caused me so many wipes that I basically just removed it from my bar. I think they kind of fixed it based on the feedback I've been hearing like it's actually useful so I'll look into that. I taunted the pick Belcher out and just to keep some distance away from the slime ads. But as we get to higher and higher DPS keys, like, uh, sorry, as we get to higher and higher keys, like, a lot of the bottleneck in terms of whether you can time keys comes down to just good DPS. And this is something that, you know, my party have been spending a lot of time thinking about in terms of how to optimize our damage. Right, with the manifestation of pride spotting here. I pop weapons of order because I feel like you know, most of the party is probably saving their damage 
the boss. You guys can see I'm running the Sanguine Vintage Trinket from Heroic Sire Dinatrius. And it's on a one minute cooldown, you guys can see it here. And I've been testing it out to see whether it's better than Blood Splatter skill. And quite honestly, I do feel like even though my Blood Splatter skill is at 203, while the Sire Dinatrius Trinket is at 220, the Blood Splatter skill is actually way better. And I don't really know how to explain it. I think the way I'll put it is the one minute trinket from Sidinatrius shields you for about 13k of damage. While the Sidinatrius, sorry, while the Blood Splatter skill is a flat close to almost 40k of mitigation if you get the Blood Splatter skill on all five targets in Mythic Plus, which is really easy, right? Because you do group pulls. And I'm starting to think like that's a better trinket. But unfortunately, guys, I do not have the 226 version of it from my weekly chest that, you know, I personally do know some of the lucky few ones who got it. So I'm still waiting for good things to happen to me in my weekly chest. Hopefully it comes soon. You guys can see like during the click storm, I actually dispelled the, the DK because he is obviously the slowest moving uh, party member amongst all of us. And he needs all the help he can to dodge slime waves. Just working on Glock Grok here. Another pick storm, but the boss should be dying really, really soon over here. There you go. So here's something else that I also changed in my route, and I'll talk about you know, why I changed it. So the first pull here is the same. I pulled in the spine breaker, breaked out the canister. Basically, once the canister the canister explodes on them, they, it puts a very nasty debuff on them. It's like a dot that, you know, just takes them down over time. So you can see the mobs are basically like dying to just, you know, dots passively. And I actually proc my cheat death there. That was from all the slime claws just, you know, casting on me simultaneously. So something else that we could have done on this pack is we needed a party to basically single target stun and just to stagger the, the cast on me. Because that actually one shot me. Um, and my my Sun King Salvation Trinket proc there. My Hunter almost dies from soaking the slimes. Um, and here is where I think I made the first little mistake. So I'm trying to commit it to my memory as I rewatch this clip. The Plague Boros start exploding around 30% if I'm not wrong. I don't think that it's on a timer, it's on a health um, trigger. So I should have started to pull it in at 50% maybe, or maybe 40%. Yeah, 45-50%. Yeah, see, at 30%, they start, you know, triggering like explosions and whatnot. Just unfortunate I couldn't get them in to the first explosion. I can only use it for the second one. I stunned it. It's about to explode now, I believe. There you go. I'm going to bring them back. They're going to chase me. They're going to all get a dot. And there's a couple of them in Sanguine, but you know, it doesn't matter, the debuff's already on them. Alright, there you go. I used Touch of Death to get rid of it, because I knew it was sitting in Sanguine. And I think the Hunter made a good play, he actually trapped the slime, so it doesn't move and the patrol actually stays stationary. I think that was a good play. So we are working on this uh, pack separately from the next pack, because... I think chaining this into the Plague Boris is actually dangerous. Because there's too much things to kick at this point. I think they removed the root from the Plague Binder, by the way. In the past, when the Pestilence cast hits you, you actually are rooted. I think they removed it. I might be wrong, but on beta, it definitely rooted me. I just noticed it. That's interesting. I'm obviously being a monk, I can self-dispel here, very very handy. Uh, we're using the Plague Borrow to blow up the Plague Binder here. Um, once one of the Plague Borrow goes off, like this entire pool, you know, it's really simple because they chain into explosions one after another and it just makes very quick work of everything here. But they're all dead and we have another canister, so I'm gonna pull the slimes to the canister now. That way... Um, you know, make full use of time. So this is something I changed because I normally don't pull this pack according to my MDT video route. But I think when you're pushing for higher keys, like you need to squeeze time out from 
this entire area and this is the most efficient way to get count just using canisters to blow things up similar to the cannons and told the gore in bfa if you guys remember that so the change that i made is i did this pull this pack that i normally skip the trade-off is you will not get prideful on the dot for domina venom blade so we wanted to b-rest my dk here but i think he released so that's unfortunate no, it's okay it's no big deal we pop cooldowns here hunter pop cooldowns just to kill the pride but yeah the trade-off here is that if you do this pack you will not get the prideful on the dot on domina venom blade and that might be a problem simply because um domina venom blade is actually quite a challenging boss especially if you're doing it in parts and you do not coordinate you know cooldowns on healing and externals and defensives the fight could the fight could basically drag on but in a coordinated group on a fortified week i don't think like domina venom blade is a big problem so over here what we're getting the party to do is dragging it to the canister i'm waiting to land just to drop my debuff and i'm going to ring them into the canister here you guys can see so i don't take damage from the canister myself once that goes off the conduit slime will take down very quickly so we're bringing down the conduit slime once the conduit slime is down it will give us uh, way more time to kind of work on the next pack because the conduit slime basically puts a aura um on mobs near it that gives them a damage reduction aura so if you get a necro lord to flashcraft beside it by the way you get the aura for two minutes i believe uh, i believe so we put the next pack here pulling it backwards away from the canister is because i do not want to use the canister on the three slimes here because i do want to use the canister on the pack that guards the entrance to the next area those are definitely a way harder pull so you want to use the canister for the harder packs of mobs where possible. Alright, so just cleansing myself here. Alright, we managed to green pretty well there. Alright, so mounting up, just running across here. And here I'm calling for um, my hunters and my mages to basically kick the pick binder in. So I'm assigning kicks and telling people like, you know, get the pick binders. And you guys can see like my DK did the first grip. The first kick came from my mage. And here we are blowing them up um, on the canister. Uh, my shammy died to the frontal, which is hard to see because the spine breaker was channeling at an awkward angle. So anyway, you can see with the canister, everything takes down really quickly. Like, you know, the slime claws just evaporates. Uh, we need to dodge the frontal. Again, that thing one shots on a fortified week like that. And there you go, Spine Claw dies, away from the, or rather Spine Breaker dies, over here, away from the Sanguine Puddles. And yeah, I, I felt like we did save quite a bit of time, just, you know, doing the additional pack of slimes, being able to access the canisters to the right was very helpful, so I think that's definitely something that, unless it's Tyrannical Week, I will continue doing so. Because I feel like you definitely want the canisters there to help you on a fortified week but on tyrannical for domina venom blade i will probably still want full prideful buff on domina so i would change the route to just make sure i get my 80 percent count on domina venom blade you can definitely use the plague boros here to blow the slime tentacles up by the way it's a bit of a tricky maneuver um because the tentacles will basically grab and 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 just perma stun someone unless they are free and you guys can see that's what happened to me here exactly so i couldn't roll out i got gripped and basically i died because of the explosions um but you know it's no biggie the shammy is raising me and uh my my mage is typing fail db because you know i guess he could have db'd earlier uh my dk rest me here just b rest but we burned the b rest here which is completely okay just waiting for the plague boros to blow up before i roll across the river to engage um, you know the black weaver i recently changed my nameplates to only show the last um 
name of the mob. I think it makes things a lot cleaner. You kind of call as well. Anyway, I dispelled myself. It's unfortunate I couldn't get a Plague Boros Explode on the Blight Weaver because I had to roll out. Arguably, we could have dropped the Binding there just to kill it. Right, we have a Plague Boros that spawned with the Manifestation of Pride. And this is like the best thing possible because you can actually use the Plague Boros to blow up the Manifestation of Pride. You guys can see when the Plague Boros dies, it chunks the Manifestation of Pride here. Obviously, you have to tank the damage though. Like, you have to tank the... Um... You guys can see like the... He pride there taking a huge chunk of damage and it's like just evaporating at this point. So it's definitely helpful. The other thing you can do is drag the Plague Boros down to, you know, the Conjute Slime on the right and blow them up. It's also possible. Uh, we opted to do the one on the left first because we have a Necro Lord in my DK. So when you have a Necro Lord, you do not want to do the island to the right first because there's two buffs you can get from the pack. You can get the damage reduction aura from the Conjute Slime and the plus 15% haste uh, buff from the other slime. So if you kill them side by side within 8 yards, the Necrolord can stand on them and just channel Flashcraft and get the aura for your party. And over here we are running across diagonally, um, you know, just making sure like you don't pull the boss, that's important. And we are gonna pull right now. Bring it to the side. As the pick binder dies, I think my DK gripped it out, if I'm not wrong. Or I ringed it or something like that. Or maybe he doesn't have it, so I had to move it. Actually, for someone who's OCD and you know playing push rig on Sanguine, it's a great feeling because you, you, you feel good when you optimize the placement of Sanguine puddles. Just, just a random note. So we're doing one last uh, pack here. And my mage actually pulled the pack before the boss actually lands, which is, you know, a risky play, but he paid off, I guess. You guys can see me using my Sanguine Vintage and the shield just evaporates, right? You guys can see it from my buff bus. So I honestly do not know like how good a trinket is, but my feeling is not that great. But it is good eye level and it's good passive agility, which I do miss and definitely helps. Alright, so both the mobs are dying here and the moment they die, my... Um, Necrolaw is going to Flashcraft on top of them. You guys can see he's going right away to Flashcraft. Getting the buffs, I'm pulling the boss. And we have the buffs and the auras. Um, you guys can see the auras to the top right here. You guys can see the two auras from the slimes. It's the damage reduction aura and the haze aura. So it definitely helps. I'm saving my cooldowns, uh, my DPS cooldowns for the moment where... And this is where my DK made a very good play and I, I think it's definitely worth mentioning this. You guys see the ads coming? So my DK instantly stood out, gripped the slime. You guys can see he gripped it. And immediately after he gripped it, I went over and paralyzed it. He basically single target stunned. That was a perfect play from my DK by the way. That's like, this is amazing place. Um, to have the awareness to do that, I think like that's a great place. So gripped it out, paralyzed it, and the benefit of paralyzing the slime is that you can then work on the plague bomb um, without the defensive aura from the slime affecting the plague bomb and the boss. Because normally the, the slime is being tanked beside me, right? And we have to kill the slime before we work on Dr. Akers, which is a waste of time. Um, although we made a mistake here, I told the hunter to trap the slime, the conjured slime. So on the next platform, I can then paralyze it again. But I think he misinterpreted it as, you know, like, he will trap this one. Um, so that's something we need to fix. So for this particular slime, we had no options. We had to play it the normal. Dodging stuff there. 
Because the moment the slime is in melee range, like it's just hard to CC because like there's dots and whatnot on it. We cut the bomb really close there. We got to easily wipe. I think people won't focus on the bomb there. Um, I guess I'm not using my Sanguine Vintage Trinket enough, right? See, it's available now. I could have used it. Just help my healer out. Probably requires more testing before I conclude whether it's good or bad. Another slime injection. And Dr. Akers goes down. So if Mahanda trap the slime that was paralyzed earlier, that would then free my paralyze to be used on this particular slime. So that way we skip all both slimes. Uh, that's the, the top process behind that. It always gives me like PTSD when like, you know, pets walk across the, the river and not pull this uh, slime here. I mean, this tentacle. It always amazes me. Waiting for Quaking before we cross the river here. This is a change that I made from my earlier take for runs. I will double pull this now. Like, cause they're all at half health. Makes no sense not to double pull them. Calling for stuns here on the Maldraxxus, which is a uh, bulwark of Maldraxxus. So I said the stun will be mine. I ring them away from Sanguine. We're gonna kill them here. Actually, while my party works on this, I am already running ahead to pull the ambushes. Right, so I'm letting my party deal with them, I think. Oh, actually not. But we're running ahead, getting the ambush out. You guys will notice that my mage is always ahead. Um, and that's because he already knows what next pack I'm going to pull and he's already prepared for it. So the change in route earlier that I made would result in us spawning Prideful at this point. So we are Prideful from this point and we won't have it for the full duration on the boss. So that's the only downside about you know clearing everything with the canister in the canister area. This is the issue that you will face. Which I don't know whether it's a good or bad thing. But I feel like it's definitely the right play though. Because the countdown was efficient on a fortified week. Um, so I'm getting out that and we kill them very evenly here, which is you know very important because well prideful spawns and you don't want prideful to be done with anything else. You want full damage on prideful, which is you know important. You guys can see my chamois is doing like respectable damage and contributing to DPS here, which honestly really helps. Like healer DPS is so underrated in keys, but it's such an important function of timing keys. It actually makes a difference. Like you might think like, oh, you know, a couple hundred DPS here wouldn't make any difference, but it adds up across like a 30 minute or 40 minute dungeon. The advantage you get compounds over time. And it's just very beneficial of a healer who can put out damage. Which kind of makes me miss healing, by the way. I used to heal. I was a healer main, so I might just... I already have the gear for a Miss Weaver, to be honest. I have the Soul Ashes, I have the gear, I have the Caster Staff. Um, although it's not like a you know 220 plus weapon, it's a 210 weapon. But I can probably heal keys. So I might just do that for fun sometimes. Alright, so we have 20 seconds of the buff remaining on the boss, so I'm gonna pull the boss right away. That's what I'm doing. That way, you know, we still get some uptime on the boss, which is great.
my mage is moving off at the last second. There you go. Breaking out the stealthies. All the range folks are helping me with it using their AoE abilities. So that's super helpful by the way. If you have a range class like a hunter or something or a mage who can get the assassins out for you, like it helps so much as a tank. Like so much because as a tank, like when you're moving around, you want to make sure that your back is not facing any mobs. So it's very awkward to kind of like back pedal and sight and, and basically like sidestep mobs while trying to pull out the stealthies. It definitely really helps to have uh, people do that for you. There's some bad plays that I actually let my Celestial, my Purified Cheese Sex drop. So not good. I could have rolled it into a bigger Celestial Brew. Lots of damage at this point. So I'm just purifying Heavy Stagger there. Just to help my chamois out a little. Should have used my trinket here, but I didn't. I chalk it down to not being familiar with this trinket. Yeah, so maybe I could have used it a bit more optimally. So I use it eventually. You guys can see like the shield disappeared. I guess I was saving it for the overlap on the ads just to make my healer's life a bit easier. I have a very big celestial blue shield here that I should be using like right now. Yep, so you see a 50k shield right there. I'm starting to think on higher, higher keys like. Playing Brewmaster is all about, you know, rolling big Celestial Brew shields at very key and crucial overlaps. Because a 50k shield is basically my full health bar. So essentially you are running with 100k effective health. Right, something to note, the Devoted Ads, they do hurt on 4 to 5 weeks, like they melee very hard. Yes, you can see very heavy stagger coming out. Alright, and we're heading down to the room here. You guys can see like we're doing very well on time. We have like 10 minutes to spare. And honestly, we're in very good hands. As long as we do not mess up this part, which is i.e. I do not die. <laughs> Because those, and I proc my cheat dev there, unfortunate. Should have kited out earlier, got greedy on building threat. So I lost, uh, lost threat there. Working on the remaining devoted ads here. That's good grip from the DK. And we have to rotate kicks on the bow flash, which is really important. Pop weapons of order as, you know, a bit of offensive, a bit of defensive measures. Just trying to, you know, dodge as much of the um, heavy melee swings from the devoted ads. You guys can see me swinging by. Just throwing my kick smash on them on cooldown. Just so I maintain the um, weapons of order debuff on them. It's a bit of sanguine, so I ring them out. More sanguine. Um, which I think my DK taunted, which I think is a good idea. Just to change the path at which they're running through. And we will get prideful here. I couldn't really get too close to the, the devoted here because I know my cheat dev is down. I don't really want to risk it. So I'm just all I'm doing is just cack smashing on cooldown. And just being cheeky with my spinning crane kick, like hopping spinning crane kick and just like hovering into their hitbox and then like dipping out before they melee me. It's just like a uh, little min max. But you guys can see like generally I stay away from devoted because you know they're really scary. I'm trying to ring them away. I filled my ring there. Um, yeah, I was planning to ring them all to the entrance, but I, you know I messed it up. DK gripped it. Good place. Kill the devoted. And now I just need to position myself to the left so this devoted guy wouldn't run through the sanguine puddles here. There you go. Alright, so at this point in time, like we're just communicating on voice comms, like who is using DPS cooldowns when. Because we know there's three phases to the boss. Um arguably 
All phases are difficult, but you want to have a solution for each phase. So we know on the first phase, we have the prideful buff for 60 seconds to carry us. In the second phase, we would have two DPS cooldowns from my DK and from my Hunter, just to blow through that phase. Because the longer the phase is, the more infectious rain you have to deal with, and the more healer cooldowns you have to burn, and eventually you run out of everything. So that's a bit of our thinking there. And we're trying to save everything we have for the final boss. Unfortunately, we have to burn Spirit Link here. Uh, but yeah, like we're gonna pop Bloodlust on the second phase. I think that's probably the hardest phase. And then the last phase is just an execute. So things are melting anyway. So our major cooldown will be back up for the first phase after it's combust. So the rationale is, um, you know, every single phase you want to have an option. Pop my trinket here. I think that was good timing. Definitely helped me soak the fair bit. I think my trinket did like 10% overall of my HPS on the meters in the entire dungeon, which I think is a lot higher than Blood Splatter Skill, but its impact just doesn't feel as great as the Blood Splatter Skill. I, it's very hard for me to explain why, but just from a freely craft perspective, like it's not great. If there's anyone with the Sanguine Vintage Trinket, like, and they feel differently about it, please let me know, like, because I'm really interested to know, you know, people's thoughts on those two trinkets. This is also for, for me to, to learn as well, I guess. Alright, second phase is here, so we're gonna pop that last year. You can see the hunter dropping wall spirits on the boss. Popping bloodlust. I'm moving over before the adds melee me. So as a tank here, you wanna try and maintain um aggro on the adds, so you know your melee DPS won't be like slapped to death by them. But the trick is also not to face tank them, because they kind of hurt. The bomb limb grip the devoted to me, which is you know a bit unfortunate. So I had to stun it there, so it doesn't like melee me, like a million damage. All right, so we push through the second phase relatively quickly with bloodlust. So, uh, that's also only possible with um, a lot of DPS cooldowns. I think someone died here if I remember correctly, or maybe it was on the third phase. I can't remember. But yeah, at this point in time, like, you need to be very, very careful not to tunnel the ads. Because you are still watching the tentacles at all times. Alright, so there's Infectious Rain, and this is the last dangerous overlap, I believe. So I'm popping Ampen Harm. I'm using everything in this phase just to help my heal out. I cleanse the Infectious Rain of four stacks from me. Someone died on tentacles here, I think. Oh no, it's the next one. I think it's this quaking that that was a bit messy. Yeah, so my my healer got meleeed by one of the ads, I believe. Not tentacles. But he anked there, which is great. I had a big celestial brew at this point. So that's how I survived. More infectious rain is coming down. But at this point in time, boss is in execute range and it's about to fall. We just need to survive at this point. Everyone use health pots and, and whatnot, and the boss will eventually fall over, like she did here. So that's basically the whole key. Like eventually, uh, we figured out that on a fortified week, we just want to squeeze as much time as possible from the canisters area, and that would definitely help. So anyway, hope the key was helpful. If it was, do subscribe to the channel. I publish daily Shadowlands content on this channel, and thank you so much for the Patreon subs who makes this community possible. If you want my weak auras and my user interfaces, they're all in the description below. Thank you so much for your support and I'll see you in the next video.